Pastor Jeff has read our key text, but from there we're going to uh, draw some of the history of the book of Isaiah and go forward to the fulfillment of what was read from Isaiah and seeing what took place in the life of Christ during that time of his crucifixion. We'll observe that from the Gospel of Luke here in a few moments, and uh, the chapter will be 22. There'll be one significant verse that we'll be looking at uh, once we get there. But prior to that, I'd like to give you some background both on the book of Isaiah and also the book of Luke. It's interesting that this book, Isaiah, has 66 chapters. Now we know those aren't inspired, those were added for help, but nonetheless in the division you have truly a division in that book that's like the Bible itself containing 66 books with 39 chapters in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. There was a division that is uh, also in the book of Isaiah between those chapters. And the book of Isaiah has often been called the Bible in miniature, one of the names given to it by theologians. Of course, the author is the one whose name appears there, Isaiah. And Isaiah was written right around 700 BC, so quite a time frame before the birth of Christ, 700 BC. And uh, it's also a book of judgment, especially in the first 39 chapters, as uh, one of the words that you will see Isaiah repeat over and over is the word woe, woe unto you, and the judgment that he was uh, prophesying to Israel. But then, of course, as it goes forward, the word salvation is a key theme as it appears 26 times in the book. And so because of that, it's also been called not only the Bible in miniature, but they have called Isaiah the evangelical prophet, the gospel prophet. When you think of Isaiah, you may think of the prophecies from that book. And in particular, at Christmas time, I think we are uh, ones who refer back to that uh, message that is there, in particular, the prophecies about Christ. And uh, just wanted to note a few of those quickly here today. One of the key prophecies is from Isaiah 7:14, where we read there concerning Christ's virgin birth. You go to chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, his ministry that would take place in Galilee. In chapter 9, verse 6, we see concerning his rule and his name. In chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, we see his kingdom reign. And then when you think of the ministry of Christ as it is given to us in the New Testament, in chapter 35, we see his miraculous ministry. And then finally, as we have read here today, as Pastor Jeff read to us, Isaiah 53, it talks about his rejection and atoning death. The song that we sang certainly connects well to what we read as that hymn was partially drawn, some of the lyrics from Isaiah 53. And so this particular book here, Isaiah, is, as we said, the Bible in miniature, the uh, evangelical message, the gospel message, but here very clearly Christ being portrayed for us. Now, before we look at the Gospel of Luke in the background, I'd like to look at one of the verses that uh, I could say for me in reading it sort of just jumped out. Maybe sometimes you have that happen when you're reading a passage, something will just really jump off the page. And this was the case, and in particular because it goes back to the book of Isaiah being a prophecy fulfilled and actually from the words of Christ of what he said in this book. So if you'll turn to Luke 22, we're going to focus just on one verse here, Luke 22 and verse 37. And Christ says, For I say unto you, 
that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So Christ here, speaking of what would take place concerning him very, very soon to follow here in this account in Luke. Let me talk to you for a moment now about the Gospel of Luke and in particular some background concerning it. Luke, as we know, is the author of this book. And in Colossians 4.14, he is called the beloved physician by the Apostle Paul. So Luke had a very important role as God inspired his word through this author. And uh, one of the interesting things concerning Luke is, as we study the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, he is the only Gentile author of scripture. So I think for we who are Gentiles, we find that as a very significant point, something that we can take to heart. And his style of writing, remember, as God inspired his word, he still used the personality of the authors. And he shows very much the accuracy that you would expect from a physician. So we see that taking place in his writing. Luke wrote approximately in the year of AD 60. So uh, not a long time after the ministry of Christ and his ascension back into heaven. And uh, if you want to think of a theme of Luke, and there could be several things we could suggest, but one of them is that he is presenting Christ as the perfect man. Uh, I think we would expect a doctor to take note of certain things about humanity. Uh, that's their job and how they uh, record those things and treat people. Well, that's really a, an overall theme here that we have as well. And uh, because he was a Gentile, he was showing us too that this message of salvation would not be just alone for the Jews, but for Jew and Gentile alike. So Luke is the author and Luke gives us a very clear picture here in his gospel of the ministry of Christ. You really look at what Luke gives us. It's from uh, the beginning uh, of Christ's ministry till the very end of his ascension. So it covers the entire life of Christ and his ministry. Now, let's harken back just a moment because of we've had the passage read to us already concerning the prophecy of Isaiah. When we heard those words read to us, we saw very clearly the picture of Christ. It was like a first-hand account that was given to us of the Lord Jesus Christ, yet it took place 700 years before his birth. And so quite significant to see how clearly this was portrayed for us. And uh, I'm reminded of a particular minister who was uh, Jewish actually. He was uh, from New York City. He involved himself in psychology and psychiatry and uh, kind of an interesting story how the Lord saved him, but from his Jewish background, he became a Presbyterian minister. And his testimony is called from Freud to Jesus. Now that's quite a jump, isn't it, to go from that uh, place in his life where he was, but I wanted to share a little bit of how he came to faith. As probably, I'm sure there are others in the history of the church that would be a similar testimony to this powerful passage from Isaiah 53. Um, speaking of history, as uh, Pastor Jeff said, my brother and I uh, love history. Uh, he is a history professor, of course, and uh, both secular history and church history. And I too uh, love history as well. So one of the points of trivia that sometimes I'll ask folks when they'll ask me about my denomination is the Bible Presbyterian Church. And we came out of the fundamentalist modernist controversy, the struggles that were going on back in the 20s and 30s. And so um, one of the points of trivia that I'll often say is, or they'll ask uh, about, is who was the first person ordained in the Bible Presbyterian Church, who became their first ordained minister. 
And uh, the name actually, for those who study history, will probably be a familiar one. His name was Francis Schaeffer. It's probably a name that you've heard of or maybe even read some of his writings. And it's interesting, I have a missionary friend that I've not seen for over a year, but I believe uh, this uh, brother who uh, still serves uh, with his family is 99 years old and uh, quite sharp, uh, quite lucid, uh, quite active, especially for 99. And now primarily his son and uh, daughter-in-law and their family are carrying on the ministry, but uh, he is there. His wife went to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. But uh, he was a part of our mission board even when Francis Schaefer was. So he'll talk about Fran Schaefer, Fran Schaefer. Well, there was that connection with our independent board of which one of the Free Presbyterian Brethren is also on our board that I've served with. And um, with the uh, departure that uh, Fran Schaefer had, Francis Schaefer had in going to another denomination, he eventually started a ministry called Labrie, which was over in Switzerland. So to make this long story short, this man that I'm referring to, this Jewish man, uh, was under uh, through circumstances that were providential, one to come to Switzerland. And uh, he was being witnessed to, and he just couldn't, uh, you know, reconcile certain truths because of his Jewish background. So he had one of his mentors, one of the men teaching him, that actually read from Isaiah 53. And uh, he said, well, of course we could have an account like that, that is firsthand right at the site in the time of Christ's crucifixion. Of course we would have an, a record that was there given like that. And then the man took the Bible and gave it to him and he realized he had just read from the Old Testament. And so that was a stepping stone that brought him to faith in Christ. And so truly he went from the secular uh, worldliness which he was involved in by God's grace and salvation to become a minister of the gospel. So quite a, a testimony of the power of, as we said from the outset, the evangelical nature, the message of salvation that comes to us from Isaiah 53. So we know having just come through the Easter season, how it shows us the ministry of Christ and what was prophesied specifically and how those things took place literally. So Christ himself here, and just this one verse speaks to Isaiah 53. He says, For I say unto you that this that is written, speaking back then of Isaiah 53, must yet be accomplished in me. And here it is. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. So a prophecy concerning Christ is clearly portrayed. And as we had that scripture read in our hearing today, it gave to us that picture, that clear picture of Christ and his atoning work for us. So what I'd like to talk about here to uh, continue this sermon and actually kind of our central point from Luke here is the, pro the prophecy here fulfilled according to Luke. As we just said, having read verse 37, we see that Jesus takes himself back to the time that Isaiah was writing, as he draws specifically from the writings of Isaiah to say that he would be reckoned among the transgressors. And um, also, I'd like for us to turn here in the Gospel of Luke to chapter 23, if you would. We'll look at verses 33 and 34. It says, And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment, and cast lots. So here with what we find, again reflecting on Isaiah 53 and what it prophesied concerning Christ, we see things specifically stated there coming to fruition here in the crucifixion of Christ, specifically of what was said 
by Isaiah we see here, and Christ himself uh, forgiving those who did not know what they were doing. Well, in this context, as he was there with the transgressors, numbered with the transgressors, it gets a bit more specific of what Christ does in ministry to them while up on the cross. And so I want you to look a bit further here, the same chapter beginning in verse 39. It says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So we have the transgressors with whom Christ was numbered. Two of them, men who were deserving of the penalty they were receiving. They were deserving of death. And we have a contrast that is very clear to us by one who was... Uh, being very, very negative, very, very um, cruel in what he was saying. He was already condemned. He was dying. But if you really are the Christ, if you really are this Jesus that they have been talking about and all they've said, rescue us, get us out of this mess, get us out of this situation. But then God was doing a work of grace in the life of the other thief who rebuked this other thief saying that they are deserving of what had happened. They are deserving to die. But this man has done nothing wrong. And this wonderful, wonderful statement where he cries out to Christ and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. When you think of God's gracious salvation to sinners, one of the things I want us to bear in mind that as the scripture speaks about him being numbered with transgressors, it could be our minds go back to the cross and to thieves. But what I'd like for us to remember when we think of these two men specifically is that all people are in the category of transgressor. We are all transgressors. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so it doesn't matter how we see ourselves or if one is given to, you know, moralism of, you know, how good a person they are or what they do or anything of that nature. We are ones that are certainly convicted by what the scripture says that we are sinners. I never forget uh, speaking to a young lady that was uh, junior high. We used to set up at a local fair back in Pennsylvania where we ministered every summer. There was opportunity to try to get our name out, but also to, uh, to minister to people. So I remember one young lady gave us some time to talk and I asked her uh, about her relationship with the Lord and uh, sort of a, I guess a diagnostic question, why is it that you should be allowed to go to heaven? And she said very confidently and very uh, uh, with surety, because I'm a good person. That was a response. And so I took that response and went to the scriptures concerning what it said. And her eyes just got bigger and bigger and bigger as she realized the scripture had something very different to say than the opinion that she had of herself. And I uh, was able to give her gospel literature. I trust that ultimately she did come to know the Lord, but it was quite a wake up call for her to realize that she was in the category of sinner. And that is the ignorance of this world because the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. And uh, they're in that state of darkness, men and women loving darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So here in this context, we have what has often been called a deathbed conversion. And uh, different groups who sought to argue about 
what is uh, necessary for salvation and uh, usually a works-based system that things are necessary for salvation. We realize that uh, that is not at all true. It's the work of Christ that is necessary for salvation. But I know a pastor was one time speaking to another one of these pastors in sort of a works-based system. And that pastor brought them to our passage here of the thief on the cross. And after a back and forth of uh, a timeline of probably 30 minutes, finally the other person in the workspace system said, well, that is an extreme situation. To which my friend responded, sir, we are all extreme situations. We are all in the place of sin. We are all in the place of death. So he used that to show them that uh, the grace of God can come to a person, yes, as our children that are here. We certainly hope that they uh, come to faith in an early age, but uh, that may not be the case. And uh, we know that God is a God of salvation, a God who delights in mercy. And so this thief was given that wonderful promise. Today, you will be with me in paradise. You ever have discussions with people uh, concerning uh, what happens after death, even Christian people wondering? And I said, the scripture is very clear. Absent from this body means to be present with the Lord. And this is an example of that. This thief who died there in Christ, believing in Christ, went to be with Christ in paradise as was promised. There is a day coming of resurrection when the body and soul will be reunited. But uh, to be with Christ, as Paul would have said, is far better. And that is the uh, place that uh, God has promised for us, eventually bringing soul and body together. I'd like to look at um, another conversation that uh, took place uh, with our, our Lord here, beginning in chapter 24. Now, this is after the crucifixion, and Christ is resurrected, and see the ministry that he has in the lives of others. We're going to go to chapter 24 and begin here in verse number 25. Now, Christ had been speaking to two men on the Emmaus Road to give you the background here. And uh, I still remember as a child this seven mile long sermon as Christ was going and the men would have gone further, the Bible says. But uh, they had this conversation where Christ acted as if he didn't know what had gone on. Of course, he knew fully and uh, began to speak to these two men. And I want us to look at a little bit of this conversation because he says in verse 25 to them, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Obviously, when we read the accounts of scripture and we think about what they would have been like and the times of being under Christ in that earthly ministry, this is certainly one of the times I would have been absolutely uh, fascinated to hear how he went back to the Old Testament scriptures to proclaim himself. And of course, we see that he went back to the various uh, categories of scripture as we categorize them, going to the law, going to the Psalms, going to the prophets. Could he have gone back again to Isaiah 53 to proclaim some of the truths there about himself? It could have been. It's not recorded for us, but he was going back and explaining who he was according to the Old Testament scriptures, the things concerning himself. So we see this connection 
and Luke's gospel bringing forth for us the things that were said in the Old Testament. And one of the aspects of prophecy, which you may be familiar with, is that in the Old Testament setting, certainly there was prophecy that was preaching, that there was a telling forth of the good news or the message of judgment, as it were, in Isaiah, for instance. But of course, oftentimes then there was a future message. There was something that was going to be fulfilled at a later time. And we know that to be the case already from what we've read here, these fulfillments literally uh, of Christ and what he had done on our behalf. So this conversation here, Christ expounds the scriptures, including the prophets, to tell them who he was and what he came to do. Look at verse 44 as well here in the same chapter. And Jesus said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. So on a second occasion, as he appeared here, unannounced in their midst, and they were surprised, you know, they didn't know what to think, Christ uh, shows them that he is truly uh, Christ, that he is the God-man in person, asks them because of their doubt and their amazement, give me something to eat, I'll prove who I am. And then from that, because again, in their astonishment, he goes back as he did with these two men on the Emmaus Road, now to these individuals and tells them who he is and what he came to do. And again, the scriptures tell us that he goes back to the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms concerning me, opening their understanding that they would know the scripture, showing himself from the Old Testament scriptures. As I mentioned a few moments ago, when we look at this Gentile, Dr. Luke, he gives us the incarnation of Christ even before the incarnation, as he spoke of that incarnation that was coming, to the ascension of Christ. And it's interesting as we look at what Luke gives to us, the fulfillment of all that Christ uh, was concerning the Old Testament scriptures, but now in person we see that taking place in our account before us. Let's continue now and see how Luke closes out the life of Christ in his writings after we understand the explanation that Christ was giving to those that he was with concerning himself. Verse 46, And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. For behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. If we were to turn to the book of Acts, the first chapter, we have this scene again given to us, a bit more specific in the details that take place. But uh, as Christ parted from those that he was with on earth, we see that he was taken up to heaven visibly and bodily before their eyes. And uh, the angels say to them, why are you standing here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that you have seen go up into heaven will come in like manner. And uh, so we have it all kind of put together from the beginning to the end of the prophecies of Christ's coming, the ministry of Christ and what he came to do, his doing of it in our behalf, on our behalf, and then after the crucifixion and burial and resurrection, yes, the ascension and the promise of the second coming, all of that included in the message for us. So the first coming of Christ 
has a second coming promised. We conclude this book here in Luke seeing that. We go to Acts chapter 1. We see that happening. And the outworking of the gospel message to the ends of the earth. And we too are ones who came, as I mentioned, as transgressors. At some point, if we are in Christ, knowing that the gospel came in power by the Spirit, that we could believe, realizing that he took our transgressions, that he was bruised for our iniquities, that he was one who bore our sins upon himself. We are reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that God the Father, he the Father made him, Christ, sin for us. Christ knew no sin that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. So Luke gives us a very, very clear picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, this account that is given to us, and then the conclusion that we see, all encompassing of his prophecy that he would come, that he did come, and what he came to do on our behalf. The first coming has the promise of the second coming of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for the ministry of the gospel. Father, we thank you that both Old and New Testament alike show us Christ, that no matter where we go, we see that he is portrayed. And we thank you, Father, for the word and the words that are so clear to us that have rung true in our souls that Jesus is alone the way of salvation. We praise you, Father, for what we have seen and learned and been reminded of again yet this day of the work of Christ on our behalf. So we pray for your blessing to rest upon us now. We pray that by your spirit you would impart to us this message into our hearts and minds that we would go from here different from when we came. Father, we thank you so much for the ministry of Christ, Lord, the doing and dying of Christ that saves us, his finished work. And Father, we are reminded again, as this passage has reminded us, that the same Christ who entered into glory will one day come again. We praise you for that. We thank you for the surety of this message. We thank you that Christ is our all in all and has saved us, as the scripture says, to the uttermost. So we ask for your help and strength by your spirit. Father, conform us to the image of Christ and help us again to take these words to our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.